Good morning. What an exciting time to be able to be together to worship. I have just a few announcements this morning. Real quick, the last several weeks we are having more and more guests each and every week and I just want to bring that to your attention for one reason uh, especially is this, is oftentimes after getting your children dropped off and, and making it into this room, you're trying to find a seat and you don't know where to sit down. If you're sitting in an aisle and you have 32 seats next to you and you see somebody you don't recognize, if you'd scoot towards the middle and allow them to grab a seat on the on the end of the aisle instead of having to climb over somebody for the very first time. That would really help us out. It's exciting that people are coming to join us. It's exciting that we're getting to worship with people that are new, and we want to make them feel as welcome as we can. Also, some of you may be like I am. I'm a, I'm a little different. I love to listen to podcasts. I love to listen to talk radio and things like that. We actually have a new podcast out on our website. You can check it out on our website. You can check it out on, on Facebook. It is very good, it's on discipleship. So we would love for you to be able to learn and grow throughout your week and, and check that out. Also, starting point. I believe that this church is one of the best churches in the world. And I believe that every person here should be plugged in somewhere. And if you're a new member, or if you are beginning to try to figure out like, hey, I need to take that next step and get plugged in somewhere in our church, starting point is for you. And you can sign up at our Connect desk, or you can sign up on our homepage or our website. But that is a place for you to be able to hear from our staff. That is a place for you to be able to hear the heart of our church. And that's a place for you to be able to say, this is where I would love to get plugged in at. And that's a wonderful place for you to be able to go. Also, everybody needs a group. We're not meant to go through this life alone. And Life Group is a place that you get the opportunity to learn people, to meet people, to go deep, deeper in your faith and deeper in your walk with the Lord. And if you're not a part of a Life Group, we want to encourage you to be a part, part of one. We meet at 9 a.m. We also have several, several opportunities throughout the week. Refuel on Wednesday nights. There's an opportunity for each and every person in the room. So if you're not plugged into groups that are smaller than this setting, we want to encourage you to, be, to do that and to be so. That is a great place to begin to make lifelong friendships, and we want to encourage you to be a part of those. And last but not least, if you're in the room, it's for your very first time, or, or maybe you've never told us you've been in the room, we'd love for you to fill out a Connect card. It's just like this right here. And that's not so we can hound you and, and, and hunt you down and, and throw things at you. It's so that we can tell you we love to have you here. And we just want to be able to connect with you. And uh, we have a small gift for you back at our connect table. If you'll fill that out and, and drop that by, we just want to be able to know how to pray for you and to know that you were here with us today. And now my favorite part, I love the preaching, I love worship, but I don't know if there's anything that I will enjoy more on a Sunday morning than to celebrate a new believer in baptism, all right? So that's what we're going to do. If you'll direct your attention to Tanner, the baptism waters. Good morning, church family. Just like Andrew said, this is one of the most exciting things that we get to participate in as a church family. We get to see the, the physical representation of, of Christ's death and resurrection, as well as those that are coming for believers' baptism, representing in their own lives their death to self and raising to walk in a new life with Christ. And so this morning I have with me Eric DeBoer, I have Kira Bullock and Peyton Arrowwood. So if you are family or friends of any of those individuals, please go ahead and stand. And then I'd also like to invite the, the rest of our church family to stand as well. And so Eric, who is it that you profess as Lord of your life and Savior of your life? Jesus Christ. Amen, brother. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, Miss Kira. And who is it that you profess to be Lord of your life and Savior? Jesus Christ, amen. Well, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.
This is Peyton Arrowwood, uh, my oldest daughter. Peyton, who is it that you profess as Lord and Savior of your life? Jesus, amen. Well, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you, and God, we thank you that we are able to celebrate in new life in you, Jesus. Father, I pray as we continue in worship, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word, and Father, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth with our voices and our entire being. And I pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus, amen.
glad we serve a very personal God. I want to sing that chorus again. Miss Lisa, play with us. You, you walk on the waters, you speak to the seas, you stand in the fire beside me. Let's sing that together. You walk on the our song service, but right now, Lord, I just want to lift high your name. Lord, I just want to dedicate this time to you and to your name alone and to let you know that it's all about you. And Lord, if we're hanging on to anything that is of ourselves, Lord, if we're hanging on to anything else that's not our rock, that's not our redeemer, that's not our Messiah, that's not our savior, that Lord, we would let it go. Because Lord, this time is for you. And Lord, if we'll fix our hearts, we'll fix our eyes on you, our focus is on you, Lord, we, all the other things will just fade away. So Lord, take it from us. Take it from us. And let us experience the power of your name today in our lives, in our families, in our church, in our country, in our world. Thank you for the power that's in your name and letting us experience that power.
Christ alone, into the 
this morning as we prepare for our pastor to come. I pray that here behind this pulpit, he would stand in your power. He would stand in your love. Lord, he would stand in your grace and he would stand filled with your spirit as he presents to us the word that you have given him. I pray that he's able to articulate it well and Lord, that we are able to receive it well. So Lord, the, where you want us to apply it, Lord, we will apply it to our lives. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for what he's done. Thank you that we live in him. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. As you're turning there, I want to let you know that Thursday, Friday, and Saturday till noon, your seven senior pastoral staff members took our first retreat together where we prayed one for another. We prayed for you, cast vision, discussed the future together and what that looks like discussed the four core values uh, that we're in the middle of. Today is the second one, Christ-centered. And I want to tell you, I am a blessed man to serve with those other six. Uh, you have a great pastoral staff here, First Baptist, and I hope you realize that. While we were gone, we came to, to know about four, well, three uh, deaths in our church family or a relative of our church family. A fourth one I found out about this morning. And so this upcoming week, there'll be multiple funerals and multiple people in our church family going through a time of grief. And so we need to be mindful of one another in regard to that. And so I'd like to just pray for those families right now. Lord God, people are hurting. You know this full well. And I pray for each of these families going through the passing of a loved one. I pray you would minister to them. I pray that you would be their refuge and strength and that you would show yourself strong on their behalf. I pray that as they ponder the life of the deceased, I pray you would put a smile on their face for the great moments, the great memories, the great times with that individual. And I pray you would bring comfort and peace. I also pray, Lord, that you would bless the preaching of your word today, that you would tame my words to exactly what you want said. And Lord God, just guide and direct in this time. Holy Spirit, rend the heavens and come down in power that the mountains might quake at your presence. Fill this room and may your presence be so heavy. There's no denying that everyone has met with you, God, today. Meet with us. I thank you for the songs we've been able to worship you through today and the truth of them, that our trust is in you, Christ, you alone, and you conquered the grave. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the sinner. You're not just part of our lives, you are our lives. We thank you, Lord, for your love and for your grace and your majesty. And we praise your holy name. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Last Sunday, we addressed the first of the co four core values, which was Bible anchored. If we're not anchored to the scriptures, it really doesn't matter about what we say about Jesus Christ, because what we say about Jesus Christ must also be anchored to the Bible. 
Who, we, who he is and what he has done comes from the Bible. We know him, we know about him from the Holy Scriptures. And so first, we must be Bible anchored and we are Bible anchored. We settle disputes according to what the Bible says. We settle disagreements according to what the Bible says. We obey what the Bible says. We don't participate in deeds of darkness because the Bible spells those out for us. The Bible is our guide, it is reliable, it is dependable. It is our authority. We live our lives under that authority. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Second is Christ-centered. When you are Bible anchored, then you focus on who Christ is. Christ, that word means anointed one. All right? Christ is the Greek word for the Old Testament Hebrew word of Messiah. All right? And so the Christ is Jesus. He is the long-awaited anointed one that came as our Savior, as the Messiah, to rescue us from our sins. And he saves any and all who repent of their sin and place their faith in him. He is the Christ, the one and only Savior. And so earlier, the choir uh, led us in a song, Jesus at the Center. When we say Christ-centered, Christ is Jesus. Jesus is Christ, and He is who we are to be centered on. And so we come to number two today, core value number two, Christ-centered. If you have found 1 Corinthians chapter 9, please join me in standing for the reading of God's Word. We're going to be looking at verses 19 through 23 today. The Apostle Paul is writing this letter to a church, to the church in the city of Corinth, and he says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law as without the law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that is infallible and inerrant, that has all authority, that has all power. And Lord God, we, ta we ask that you would take your holy word today and this text of scripture and implant its truth on our hearts. May we all leave here today by your grace, O Lord, being Christ-centered. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. So the first portion of verse 19 says, for though I am free from all men. Number one, being Christ-centered means you are free from all men. Now, that's a great statement right there. Being Christ-centered means you are free from all men. It means you don't find your self-esteem in the opinion of other human beings. It means you're free from their judgments of you or views of you. You are free. Now, specifically, Paul was referring to himself here. He's teaching us how to be Christ-centered. Paul was Christ-centered, and he's teaching the church of Corinth in this letter how to be Christ-centered. And thus, God inspired it and gave him the words to write down, and God is teaching us through this letter how to be Christ-centered. And he says, I'm free from all men. Well, Paul was a Roman citizen. Now, in Rome, in the Roman Empire, I should say, there were tens of millions of slaves during the first century. But if you were a Roman citizen, you could never be a slave. And Paul says, I am free from all men. He can never be a slave. He, he can never be owned and enslaved by someone else. He is literally physically free from all men. 
Now, spiritually speaking, when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you go from being enslaved in sin and bound to sin to being delivered from it. You're free from the bondage of sin. You're also free from the penalty of sin, which is hell. Woo! I'm glad to be free. I'm grateful to be free from the bondage of sin, the penalty of sin, and I'm grateful to be free from the opinions of man. Now, I like compliments, but I don't always receive compliments. And in this life, none of us do. And the truth of the matter is, whether I receive a compliment or a criticism, I got to take it to Jesus because what he says about the situation, by what he says what I, about what I did, and what he says about me is what matters. Christ-centered. Paul was free from all men, and you as a believer are free from all men as well. Galatians 5.13 says this, for you were called to freedom. When God saved you, he freed you. You're called to it, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Your deliverance from ens being enslaved is actually freedom to thus not do what you want to do, but freedom to serve others. Let me say that one again so that we all understand what biblical Christianity is. You are not free to do whatever you want. You're free to love and thus serve others. That's what you've been freed in order to do. So being free doesn't mean, you, hey, I'm free, I can do whatever I want, I've got a license to sin. Being a child of God does not give you a license to sin. But you are free from the bondage, from the slavery of your sin and the penalty of your sin due to the graciousness of God to save your soul. If you don't know Jesus, you right now are enslaved to your sin, you can repent of your sin, you can trust in Jesus and you will be delivered from that bondage, you will be set free from that bondage and the penalty of sin today. Number two, being Christ-centered means you make yourself a slave to all. Look with me in verse 19. Paul says, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. He's free from all men, but he willingly makes himself a slave to all that he might win them. We see the same testimony given by the Lord Jesus in Luke chapter 9 of what he expects of us. It says there, if anyone wishes to come after me, here's what it means to be Christ-centered. Here's what it means to be a Christ follower. He must deny himself. Jesus is not suggesting it. He's not asking us to think about it. To be a Christ follower, to be Christ-centered, you must deny yourself, your desires, your opinions, your wants, your ways. You must deny self. Take up his cross. What's the cross a symbol of? Suffering sacrifice. You deny self. You take up the cross of suffering and sacrifice, and you follow him. And you can't follow him by staying where you've always been. Following speaks of movement. You follow. You seek after Christ. He's always a step ahead of you, and you're reaching for him. You want more of him because you're following him. Jesus teaches us that in the Gospel of Luke chapter 9. Then Paul reiterates that he's living that out here in 1 Corinthians 9. When he writes the letter to the church in Philippi, he tells them the same message. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, do nothing from selfishness. Well, when you deny yourself, you won't. When you make yourself a slave to all, you're not going to do that out of selfishness. And so, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also the interest of others. Have this attitude. Here's how you are to think. Here's how you're to act. Your attitude ought to be one 
like Christ Jesus. He says, I have this attitude in yourselves that was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus is our example. He is our model. He is our leader. We follow him. We're centered on him. Verse 6, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant in being made in the likeness of men. Jesus was free from all men, but he made himself a slave, so to speak. He humbled himself, becoming a bondservant. Why? For you. And you are now to have the same attitude of service. The same attitude that was in Christ Jesus is to be in you, where you humble yourself and you put the the. the the regard, you regard others as more important than yourself. Jesus modeled putting others before himself because he didn't have to leave heaven. He's God. He's doing just fine. We're the ones that needed the Savior. And he put us before himself. And he who knew no sin and did not deserve the cross bore the cross who we, who, for us who do deserve the cross due to our sin. He put you and me before himself. He lowered himself. He came to serve and he came to die. It says in Mark 10, 45, for the Son of Man, that's Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I'm so glad he came as a ransom. I'm so glad he humbled himself, taking the form of a bond servant. I'm so grateful that he went to the cross to pay the fine I could not pay, to pay the debt I owed but could not pay, to set me free from the bondage and the penalty of my sin. Oh, he was free, but he made himself a slave for me and you. Now, if you're wondering what Paul means when he says in 1 Corinthians 9, I have made myself a slave to all, Paul follows that statement with telling us exactly what he means. Verse 20, to the Jews, I became as a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as those under the law, not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. So number three, being Christ-centered means you are not ashamed of your heritage or your people. Paul was born a Jew. But when he received Christ, he was freed from the bondage of the law, and now he's under the law of Christ. And he says that right here in this text. But he says he became a Jew. What does he mean? He, does, he didn't become a Jew. He, he was already a Jew by birth. So when he says, I became a Jew to win Jews, that I might win some, he's speaking of his behavior. He's speaking of his daily decisions of how he lives his life. To the Jews, he says, I became a Jew. And then in verse 20, he says, I, I'm not under the law. I'm under the law of Christ. But I place myself under the law in order to win the Jews that don't believe in Christ who are under the law. In other words, he put restrictions and responsibilities on himself that he was actually, as a human being, free from. But he enslaved himself to those things in order to win people to Jesus. In Acts chapter 22, we read where he, he went through the ritual of cleansing as a Jew because he was among and around and trying to minister to non-believing Jews. And so he went through the Jewish cleansing so that he would do exactly what they were doing. So he would bond with them. So he would connect with them. He never sinned in order to be like them, to become like them. You need to realize that. He didn't, he didn't go get drunk in order to reach a drunkard. But what he did do is he did everything he needed to do to fit in with the Jews and their rituals and their laws and their way of living without sinning. He was willing to do any of them in order to reach the Jew because he was Christ-centered. He was all about the gospel. He did it all for the sake of the gospel. In Romans chapter 9, verse 3, we hear the heart of Paul. And this verse is so convicting to me. He says, for I could wish that I myself were accursed, 
separated from Christ Jesus for the sake of my brethren, for the sake of my fellow Jew, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Do you see his heart? He's telling the Roman church that if it meant my fellow Jews coming to Christ, I, I will be damned. I will go to hell for them to be saved and know the Christ I know. Now, that is an example of putting others before yourself. That was his heart. And that's why he says, to the Jew, I became a Jew, that I might win the Jew. And he did it without ever going against God's word. You don't go, we're already talked about Bible anchored. You don't go against God's word in order to reach the lost. But everything you can do and not go against God's word to reach the lost, you need to consider doing. And that's what Paul was saying. Number four, being Christ-centered means you represent Jesus to all people. Verse 21, to those who are without the law, as without the law, though not being without the law, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without the law. Not only would he reach the Jew and follow the law among the Jews, but when he was among the Gentiles, and by the way, if you don't know if you're a Jew, you're a Gentile. I'm a Gentile. Most of us are Gentiles. If you don't know you're a Jew, because Jews know who they are, they know their lineage and heritage, okay? And we're Gentiles. And he's saying, we're not under the law. And he's saying, I reach those people too. I reach Gentiles too. In fact, it speaks of it in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, where Paul says to the church in Ephesus, to me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. So Paul could reach the Jew with the gospel, and Paul was about reaching the Gentile with the gospel. The Jews had a certain diet. They didn't eat certain foods. So Paul, when he was around them, never ate those foods, never agreed to those foods, never did anything to undermine the gospel. Well, when he was with the Gentiles, if they offered him that same food that the Jews didn't eat, he would eat it. Because he did not want to offend the host who offered him that food. Paul adapted to his environment because he was Christ-centered. Jesus did this. As you go through the Gospels, you see that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, a high-ranking Jewish official, and said, you must be born again. But he also would talk to the Samaritan woman at the well. Now, in those days, Jews didn't talk to Samaritans, and men didn't talk to women in the public realm. Jesus broke down both of those customs, both of those traditions, because the gospel superseded those customs and traditions. And he talked to the woman at the well that was a Samaritan. We see throughout the various stories of the gospels where Jesus used what was around him to make a connection. When we went through the I am statements, we covered that. He took bread and said he's the bread of life. He used the picture of a sheepfold and the door and says, I am the door. He took what was around him and used it for the message. Well, Paul took the environments he was in and connected to people in those environments. If he was with the Gentile, he had a certain diet. If he was with the Jew, he had a different diet. Though Paul says, I am not under the law, I'm under the law of Christ. Paul was free to eat any and all foods, but he didn't eat certain foods around certain people so that he would not be a stumbling block to sharing the gospel. Now I want you to participate in an exercise with me for a moment. Everybody ready? You're wondering if you're ready, aren't you? I want you to ponder in your mind when you hear the word weak, who are the people you think of? It may be someone that's physically disabled and they need assistance and they're, they're, they're weak. It may be someone that's mentally challenged and you're not degrading them, that they're, they, they're just considered weak because they're unable to do certain things. Maybe the weak is the person that is uneducated. 
Maybe to you, the weak are those that are extremely educated, yet they don't understand Jesus Christ. And so you consider them to be weak. Maybe to you, the weak is, are those people in our society that vote exactly the opposite of you in every political election. They're just weak. Maybe the weak are those that are pro-choice. Maybe the weak are those to you that are pro-life under any circumstance. They're just weak. Maybe the weak are those that wear masks due to COVID. They're just, those people just don't get it. It's not going to help them. Why wear that mask? They're just weak. Or maybe to you, the weak are those that appear strong. I don't need a mask, but really underneath the surface, they're the ones that are actually weak. Maybe to you, the weak are those that run and do whatever the government and the health department say and go get vaccinated. They're just weak. Or maybe the weak are those that refuse to get vaccinated. If they just get vaccinated, we all be healthier. Why won't they just do what will help us all? They're just weak. Maybe the weak are those that kneel during the national anthem. Oh, those people, they're just weak. Or do you maybe the ones that stand during the national anthem are weak because they don't lack the, they lack the courage to kneel. And so to you, the standing ones are weak. If you haven't noticed, I covered as many examples as I could. And I covered every viewpoint of the people within 20 miles of this building. Every single one of those views is represented within 20 miles of this building. Now let's take a look at God's word. Verse 22, Paul says, to the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. Now in his context, he doesn't tell us who the weak are. Is he talking about physically disabled people, mentally disabled people, poor people? He doesn't tell us exactly who the weak is, does he? He tells, I reached the Jew, I reached the Gentile, I reached the weak. The outcast, the downtrodden maybe. But in application, the weak is, who do you view as weak? He became those people. Now, I don't know about you, but that's very convicting to me and very challenging to me. That I need to care enough about the soul of the one that kneels during the anthem. That he or she hears the gospel. All for the sake of the gospel. To the weak, I become weak. And that I need to be able to go up to the one that wants me to wear a mask. Oh, they're just weak. But I wear a mask in order to reach the weak. But also, not be so fearful, you or me, to go up to someone not wearing a mask. Because they need the gospel. Even if you view them as weak or to the vaccinated or the unvaccinated. See, we're drawing lines and the devil is dividing our society and inside the church it's happening because people aren't Christ-centered. And the devil's not welcome here. And he's not welcome in any of our local churches. Paul says to the weak, I became, I don't just sympathize, I don't just tolerate, I don't, I don't just keep my distance, no, I become weak 
to win them. The one that is at a rally for Black Lives Matter, I can have a conversation with that person. And I don't let a view hinder me from the gospel because it's all about the gospel. I was speaking with a pastor friend just a few weeks ago and I didn't, what I'm about to share with you, I haven't done my official study on it. But he was telling me that back in the first, second, third century AD, there was a major health pandemic each of those centuries. And when those pandemics happened, the Christians and the churches saw it as a sign from God for them to stand apart from the culture. This is our opportunity to show the world our love for Christ. So what the Christians of those churches would do is they would go into a health place with a person on on a bed after a bed after a bed just filled with people that were terminally ill with a contagious virus. Terminally ill and they're contagious. And Christians would pray and say those people are dying without Christ. They would go into those buildings, sit next to them, pray over them, and share the gospel with them, realizing that they didn't have a 10% chance of getting a virus. They had like an 80% chance of getting the virus and dying. I don't know about you, but the world I live in, that sounds radical. But according to God's word, it's called normal. It's called normal. The weak becoming weak to save the weak. It's what Jesus did. It's what Paul's talking about. Verse 22, second part. I have become all things to all men. Old, young, dark-skinned, light-skinned, educated, uneducated, rich, poor, Republican, Democrat, I've become all things to all people so that I may by all means save some. Verse 23, I do all things for the sake of the gospel. Now the phrase, I become all things to all men, does not mean that Paul, again, he did not compromise his tr- the truth of Scripture or his integrity to blend in. This is not compromising here. He simply met people where they were, and he simply kept his opinion on a matter to himself. Because if he shares it, he's forsaken the gospel. They don't want to hear him anymore. I mean, how many people am I going to reach if I offend them before I share the gospel? And Paul's saying to the Jew, I don't offend them. I eat it. I I follow their customs. I don't need to. I don't even believe in them, but I do it for them. To the Gentile, they're not under the law, so I don't bring that up. I do it for them. To the weak, I become weak for them. He's always sacrificing. He's not calling on them to sacrifice. He's doing the sacrificing. And nowhere in the text do we know his opinion on any of it. He doesn't give his opinion. It doesn't matter. The gospel supersedes his opinion. Paul becoming all things to all men was not due to fear. It was out of love, unconditional love for his neighbor. He never compromised the word. He never dropped or lowered the standard of holiness. He simply simply set aside personal privileges, personal rights for the sake of the gospel. Please hear me, church. Paul would have compassion for the employee. He would be brokenhearted. He would sympathize. He would would bond with the one 
that is working in a workplace that they're going to lose their job if they don't get vaccinated. Paul would have compassion for the single mom that teaches eighth grade at the local school, yet has a child with severe respiratory issues. And if she gets the virus and takes it home to her son, he will likely die. And yet people in the same church are making such a big deal about putting on a mask. Paul would have compassion for her. Paul would have compassion for the pregnant woman that is in a work environment where she has to wear a mask because it's mandated in the workplace all day long, yet she's pregnant and it is affecting her health to have a mask on all day long. Here's what I'm saying. I truly believe the culture wouldn't have any idea what Paul's opinion on any of it would be because he wants to reach them with the gospel. He, he wouldn't degrade any of those views, any of those positions, any of those people. He would, he would grieve with them over their circumstances. How do you know when to take a stand if you're Christ-centered? This has been a challenging question for me recently. If I was back in 1962 when Bible reading and prayer was removed from our public schools, I would think if that was happening today, I would be encouraging all of us to speak up in love and respect to keep Bible reading in our public schools because it goes to being Bible-anchored and Christ-centered. I believe if I was pastoring in 1972 when abortion was legalized throughout this country, I would think I would be leading people to say, we need to take a stand against this and fight against the legalization of abortion because it is a biblical issue that life is a gift from God and it begins at conception. The Lord formed us, each of us in our mother's womb. It's a biblical issue issue. But I'm here to tell you I could take a stand on that, but if someone comes here and in a room this size, likely there are ladies in this room that have had an abortion. I want you to know you are loved, and if you have repented of your sins and asked God to forgive you, He has forgiven you, He has restored you, and your value is not found in what you did, it's found in what Jesus says about you. And you would be welcome to grow in your faith here and to serve and to love others and to help others through various aspects of life. God's not through with you if you are guilty of that. See, we can separate a viewpoint from how we treat a person. So when do you know when to take a stand? Currently, being Christ-centered has taken another level of application. Because what we're going through today is not something where I ought to say, whole church, here's what our view ought to be. Because I don't have any scripture to anchor it to. There is not any scripture that tells us all to get vaccinated. There's not any scripture that says no one should get vaccinated. Are y'all with me? There's no scripture that says you should not put a mask on when your government wants you to put a mask on. There is no scripture that says don't ever wear a mask or to wear a mask. You know why? Because this is a Romans 14 issue, and I'm going to get to Romans 14 a little further when we get to unity focused, okay? Romans 14 says, in the same church of Rome, some of you believe you should not eat meat sacrificed to idols, and there's other of you in the same church eating meat sacrificed to idols. Some of you are Jews that think it's wrong. Some of you are Gentiles that think it's okay. Do not start Second Baptist Church down the road. <laughs> Don't split, because you can still have biblical unity and have differing opinions. More on that to come in a few weeks. But 
We've got to be careful imposing opinions on people and making our opinions known more than Jesus. Christ-centered, 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 all for the sake of the gospel. All for the sake of the gospel. That is the lens you are to look through in every decision you make. Should you lose your job for not being vaccinated? I can't tell everyone the answer to that question. You've got to pray and discern that on whether it's worth losing your job over. And I would say in a room this big, for some of you, the answer is get the shot, keep your job. And for some of you, it is lose your job and don't get the shot. Because God's going to tell you that specifically in application to the scriptures. It's not a blanket answer for everybody. And that's what's lacking today. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Here's what I'm trying to get across. What you see on social media and what you hear in the community should not be the way the church of the Lord Jesus talks and thinks. We ought to be different. We ought to be separate in our vocabulary, our compassion, our understanding, and our lack of judgments upon others. Because we are free from all men, yet we make ourselves a slave to others. We put them and their view, we regard them as more important than ourselves. Why? For the sake of the gospel. Because Jesus is the center. Jesus is the center. Jesus is not a part of your life. He is your life. And when you were saved, believer, you confess Jesus as your Lord. Lord means owner, ruler, master boss. Now think about that for a moment. It means that if he's in charge, you do whatever he says. It means you don't have any rights. He is your authority. He is your Lord. You are a slave to him. And because you're a slave to him, you serve others. Because you're a slave to him, you follow in his footsteps and regard others as more important than yourselves. This is what the Word of God says. It is not for us to consider. It is for us to follow. This is not what Brother Derek says. This is what the Lord says. It is his Word. Jesus could have stayed in heaven, but he humbled himself and put you and me before himself. And he put those out there that need to be reached with the gospel before himself. Now you're an extension of Jesus. You're his ambassador. You are to put them before yourself that you may win them to Christ. Will you do that for Jesus? If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes, please. Is there anything in your life where you are hindering the gospel, the spread of the gospel, the truth of the gospel? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Because it doesn't matter how hard you try to do right, if you don't have him in you, if you have not experienced his forgiveness, his grace, his re- the resurrection of new life in him, being born again, then you will always fail. But if you will surrender to Jesus now and confess him as your Lord, turn from your sin and turn to him, giving your life to him, he will save your soul. He will make you new. He will open your eyes and the eyes of your heart to walk in obedience to him with joy. He will deliver you from the bondage of sin and the penalty of sin. Do you know him? Right where you're sitting, you can call on the name of the Lord right now and ask him to save your soul. Lord God, help us to yield to you. And may you reign in us and through us. Shine your light through us, God. 
let us be a witness to our community. Let us place the gospel, your word, at the forefront. Use us. Allow us to see souls saved because we share your life-changing gospel. Save the lost right now. Draw them to yourself and lead them to call on you right now. I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.